What's going on everyone? Coach Aaron here, back in with another video. And today we're gonna to talk about all our benefits for you to become a referee. All right, everyone, welcome back to the channel. Welcome back to another video. As I said in the intro, today we're gonna to talk about why you should become a referee and all the benefits for you as a lifter or a coach or a meet director to become a referee. So we'll quickly start off with some of the numbers in USAPL as far as referees and why we need more referees and then we can go into the benefits of you becoming a referee. Taking a look at last year's numbers since this year's not over yet and it's a little bit of an odd year, some of the roundabout numbers for USAPL are that our membership was around 23,000 members, but our referees were around 1,150. So our national average is that referees make about 5% of our total membership. And if you break this down by state, since we do have the membership and the referee per state, many of our states fall into that 5% category. Some of them may be higher or lower if they have a much smaller membership and that number of referees can really skew the percentage. But a lot of them fall into that maybe a little bit higher or lower by a couple percentages, like Florida tends to be a little bit lower, like three to 4%, and some other states might be a little bit higher, like six or 7%. So we don't have that many referees, and it's kind of been stuck at this 5% for uh, quite some time. So it becomes difficult to find the referees to run more and more meets as we're doing more meets each year. So last year we did about 400 meets. Years before that we were at more around two to 300, but we're continuing to grow. But one of the limits is gonna be that we don't have enough referees to continue to do more and more meets throughout the year. Or you have to continuously use the same, same referees and kind of run them dry each and every year until they don't wanna do it anymore. At the national level, we also have a limit that we're hitting with these meets getting bigger, the high school nationals, the collegiate nationals, and then the raw nationals, are all growing in size, turning into 500 plus, 1,000 plus, three, four, five platforms. And so you need so many referees in one weekend or one week in one location for that date that it becomes very difficult to get enough referees. I was the technical secretary with Scott Dobbins for collegiate nationals last year, and we got to see this we needed over a hundred referees just to run that five platform championship because everyone's schedule is different of which days they can work with sessions they can work and all that kind of stuff especially if they're also lifting or coaching and not only did we need a hundred plus we also needed a large portion of that being the national or higher level referees because they're the ones that are in the chair and they're the ones that are on the jury we can't use the state level referees for that so when you take a look further into that 1,150 referees, you'll see about 80% of them are state referees and then 20% are that national or international. So now from that 1150, you only have 20% to pick from for those national level competitions to put them in the chair on the platforms and then in the juries. That's why, again, we struggle with referees and we struggle with having enough juries is that there's just too many big meets and too many meets and, and not enough referees. So we're always looking for more referees, which is why kind of making this video. So if you are a lifter, what are some of the benefits to becoming a, a referee? One of the big ones is that knowing the rules or knowing the rules even further and all the ins and outs and everything when it comes to studying for the referee exam and, and being in the chair and getting practice is that you learn those rules and you become a better lifter because of it. You get to learn things that maybe you didn't look into as a lifter, like how a lot number affects weigh-ins or the competition, what happens in various tiebreakers, when can you change a deadlift attempt and how many changes you can make, all these little things that a beginner lifter may not look into but someone who's studying for the state referee exam will look into and learn and it can make them a better lifter on the platform. And the other thing is, as a referee at a meet, is you're seeing so many attempts. Oftentimes meets are 30 to 50 lifters for like a smaller local meet. Some of these bigger meets, like I said, 500,000 lifters. So you're seeing so many squats, so many benches, so many deadlifts from all different groups of people, different age divisions, different experience levels, different ways they're, they're shaped, different ways they're set up that you start seeing tendencies. You see like mistakes that people make. You see people that execute things well and you come across every single type of scenario that could possibly happen. 
So then you can use that and learn from those people's mistakes to again, make you a better lifter. Personally, I also believe that it promotes longevity in the sport by being more invested in the sport. And by being invested, I mean, it's like you're working these different things. So if you're just a lifter and let's say you're a beginner lifter, you're only about a year in and you, you are progressing very well and you're not injured, everything is going well, you're doing two, three, four meets a year, that's all great. But as soon as you start kind of plateauing or maybe you hit your first injury and you have to like take a step back and restart again, that may lead to you just kind of quitting or leaving. And that's why a lot of times our membership in USA Powerlifting and I'm sure in these other federations only last maybe two years, three years, and then the person moves on and you never see them again. What can get you more committed to the sport and more committed to whatever federation you like to be involved in and that group of people that you're around in the gym and everything like that is to be a little bit more invested than just being a lifter that competes two or three times a year. So now if you are a referee, now you may also referee a couple times a year on top of the lifting. So you compete at some meets and then when you're not competing and there's a local meet in your area, you can referee. And being involved not only as a referee but also as a coach or a meet director or anything like that kind of gets you more invested into the sport. You're committed more of your time, your money, your effort, uh, everything like that to the sport. And so you're more likely to stick with it longer, which can then help you to get over that plateau as a lifter or that injury as a lifter and come back even better afterwards. And if you're not a lifter or you're maybe you're not that good of a lifter, you're not worried about it as much, but you are a coach, then it, there can be benefits as a coach as well. One of the big things, same thing as a lifter, is as a coach, you need to know all the rules and you know, need to know all the ins and outs. And a lot of coaches don't do that. But again, when you become a referee and you're studying for the exam and you're sitting in the chair, you're learning everything, not only on the platform, but you're also learning the weigh-in process, equipment check, you're learning the drug testing, you're learning all these different things that can then make you a better coach when you are coaching your lifters um, at any level of meet, whether it's local, or regionals or nationals or Arnold, anything like that. If you are a high school or collegiate athlete, then also there can be some benefits of the volunteer hours you may wanna to do to help build up your resume if you're trying to get a certain job or you're trying to go to a certain school. So in some of the bigger states that are more well known and developed, there's a lot of collegiate teams that will come and they'll referee meets or spot load meets or help set up meets. Sometimes the meet director will give them money, which can help them build their club team and use that to go to their own meets and to nationals. But also, even if they don't get money, they can get volunteer hours for their club and for themselves. That can help them, like I said, on their resume for whatever they're trying to do. All right, and aside from even being a lifter or a coach, if you just wanna be a referee, we do have some people that are only referees. They don't compete anymore. Or maybe they never competed or maybe they're not interested in coaching is that you can still do a lot of things as referees, especially the ability to travel around within your state or within the country or even within the world as you develop from state level to national level to international level. At the national level, we do have nationals moving around everywhere and we have the Arnold that's always in Columbus, Ohio. And we are trying to always give more money to the referees to come. So they cover hotel rooms, they'll cover food, Sometimes now they offer a stipend. If you're only coming to referee, if you're not lifting and you're not coaching, they'll give you an additional stipend just because you're coming as a referee. In some cases, like I said, since we have so many lifters at a competition like collegiate nationals or raw nationals, and we get desperate for referees, that for certain referees that are gonna come work a lot of sessions, we may even cover their plane ticket. So now you may get a free trip or a very cheap trip to a location, maybe somewhere you would like to go to, and you can be able to work and referee, hang out with other powerlifters and everything, and also in your free time, maybe do something fun there, kind of like a little mini vacation. And the same thing is said for the international level. Once you become a IPF category two or one referee, we have to designate at least one referee for a world championship when we're sending a team. And so that designated referee will get their expenses covered plus a small stipend to go. So for example, the classic world championships were supposed to be in Belarus. We would have had to send a designated referee to go with that team for that world championship. So that referee would have gotten their plane ticket covered. They would have gotten half their hotel room covered because they would be rooming with 
another person, another referee or another lifter or coach to cover the other half of the hotel room. And they would have gotten a stipend to help cover like food, some other expenses, and then also just making some money for going over there and working as a referee. And then again, you would work some sessions on some days, whatever your availability is, but then you'd also have some free time to meet power lifters from other countries, um, meet other referees, learn stuff like that, and then also travel around a little bit in the city and do some touristy things. So again, you get a free trip or maybe a, a very cheap trip to somewhere in the world that we like to go. So it becomes a cool little way to go to somewhere that you want to go for little to no money and give back to the sport of powerlifting and then also have some fun there, especially with some of the locations, for example, in our NAPF meets, that stands for the North American Powerlifting Federation for our North American Regional Championships, we tend to go to some really cool spots like Puerto Rico, Cayman Islands, Virgin Islands, Mexico, and even just the regular occurrence of going to different places in the US or Canada. So then you can basically go to like a island getaway for powerlifting, you referee some sessions, you do some equipment check, you do some weigh-ins, and then in your free time you get to hang out at the pool or go to the water, drink, hang out with people and all that stuff. So it's a really cool thing to be able to do in the sport of powerlifting. And the last point that I kind of want to make, it's like a overarching thing, is just giving back to the sport that you love. Our sport, unfortunately, is not a is not a big sport. It's not a professional sport. No one making a salary off of this. So there's something to be said about just like giving back when every time you're competing, someone else is giving back their time and money for you. So it's kind of trying to like trade off that. Okay, this person refereed while I was competing gave their time and money to sit in the chair and referee. So then once I'm done competing, I'm gonna go sit in the chair and help someone else out. So let's quickly just go over the requirements for becoming a USAPL state referee. And it kind of breaks down into three things. One, you obviously have to be a current USAPL member. Two, you have to be 18 years or older. And three, you have to be involved in the sport in some way for one or more years. It doesn't have to be involved as a competitor and it doesn't have to be involved in USAPL, if you did some other non-sanctioned meets or maybe you did work with another federation or maybe you helped out setting up a meet or spotting a loading but you haven't competed enough, it still counts. So whatever way you've been involved in the sport of power thing for one year, then that's good enough. And going over the step-by-step -step process to become a state referee, it's changed a little bit over the years but we'll go over the current process. So one, you would contact the state chair for the state that your USAPL membership is assigned to so you can get approval from them to take the exam. Then there's a practical exam and a written exam. So for the written exam, it is now online. So you can just take it at home online. It is open rule book, so you can have the rule book in front of you to help guide you through the questions. It is timed two hours, but it's usually not an issue if you study beforehand and you have the book in front of you, two hours is, is a non-issue and you need to pass it with a 80% or higher. Then there's a practical exam, and you can take it in whichever order, but oftentimes people take the written exam first because it's easier to do. Then once you have a meet that you can attend, that's where you take your practical exam. So for your practical, you would sit next to a referee and you would go through the process of different attempts on the squat, bench, press, and deadlift, telling the referee whether you thought it was a good lift or no lift, and then the referee would grade you on whether they agree with you that it was a good lift or no lift either way. And on that practical exam, you have to have a 90% or higher. Oftentimes with the practical exam, even though it's not part of the grading for the state referee exam, you do go through the process as well of learning how the weigh-ins are done, learning how the equipment check is done, learning how the drug testing is done. So you have an all around um, knowledge for when you actually do become a state referee. Once you pass those two exams and all the information has been submitted to the USAPL national office, then you would do what's called the safe sport course. So the safe sport exam is just a course that they're using in other sports and in USAPL we started recently that just goes over things that you shouldn't be doing as far as the code of conduct and harassment, assault, all that kinds of stuff. And that is just a videos, couple hours that you can just watch and take some quizzes and everything like that and pretty easy to pass and then you've passed that section. And then the last thing would be a third party background check they do on the person just to make sure that we're putting someone in a position of power that is not on any kind of list in the US like a sex offender list or a terrorist watch list or anything like that. So you just fill out some information about where you've lived the past several years 
and your personal information does not go to USAPL, it goes to this third party company that does it for lots of different organizations and sports out there. They check you across these databases and if you are good, then you are good to go. You are now a state referee. It's a pretty simple process in becoming a, a referee. Like I said, the written exam is pretty easy since it's online, a lot of multiple choice, you have the open rule book. The practical exam is pretty easy. If you have the experience and you've studied for it, then sitting next to a referee and, and seeing what's a good lift or a no lift shouldn't be too big of a problem. And then the safe sport and the background check are just little extra things that you have to do as part of the process just to know how to follow the code of conduct properly and then you're ready to go you can referee a meet and just because you are a state referee doesn't mean you always have to sit in the chair or even most of the times if you don't want to sit in the chair if you're like scared at first to sit in the chair and decide someone's lifts you can do the other things so like i said you can do weigh-ins you can do equipment check you can be the technical controller you can be the scoring manager you can be the expediter you can do drug testing all those kinds of things that we need help with that you can do but you don't have to sit in the chair right away and try to make calls in a competition. And then kind of once you're slowly easing your way in, maybe you're the scoring manager, you see how other referees are working, you kind of ask them questions, everything like that, and you feel comfortable, then maybe you want to sit in as a side referee and start refereeing some of the competitions. So hopefully that helps you out. Some of the benefits for becoming a referee it can make you a better lifter, it can make you a better coach, it can get you volunteer hours, it can help you travel around the country and the world and it just lets you give back to the sport that you love. If you have any questions about becoming a state referee or how to progress into a national or international referee, then be sure to comment below your questions and I will help you out. And I'll put the links in the description below where you can go look at who your state chair is for the state that you're residing in as far as the USAPL membership is concerned. And then also a link to where you can go see more information about the state referee exam and so that you can possibly take it if you want to. You can check out the other stuff I have in the description below as well. As far as I have a link to our podcast, if you like the stuff that I'm posting here, then you may like the stuff that we're doing on our podcast where we go into some more specific topics in a longer format. And also, as always, do that, that YouTube stuff and you can like my video, you can subscribe to my channel so you can see more videos like this and you can share it with someone else who you think may want to become a USAPL state referee. But other than that, I hope you're having a good day and I'll see you next time.